All right, let's um, let's take a look at uh, the first part. Uh, the first part is uh, balancing chemical equations, uh, but we're going to skip the balancing part. We're just going to look at uh, what types of reactions they are, because the balancing should be pretty straightforward, I think. And so when we look at this type of re reaction here, um, what kind of reaction is that? Do you know? From Chem 4, what type of reaction is that? And this would be like a decomposition style reaction, decomposition where it breaks apart into two different things. But we aren't gonna um, we aren't gonna use decomposition. You know what we're gonna call this? We're gonna call this. This is gonna be a, a well a, a redox reaction. It's a redox reaction because the oxidation states do change. Sulfur is going from plus six here to what is the oxidation state of sulfur here? Plus four. So we're going from plus six to plus four. Oxygen, here, all three of these are minus two. Now we have two at minus two and two at zero. Then we have to balance this, of course, because this is not balanced. And so this is what we call a redox or redox decomposition reaction. If we go to this one, do you recognize this, this reaction here? What kind of reaction is that? Well, maybe hy like hydrolysis type reaction where you're breaking apart water. In a way, yes, as water is reacting, but in a way, no, because in a lot of these hydrolysis reactions, you're just adding, you know, an H or an OH to this. And in this case, it's a little different than that. It would help if these were balanced, probably, but. When we're looking at this, in Chem 4, what would you have classified this one as? A combination reaction. But, you know, there are different kinds of combination reactions. And so looking at this, let's see, did, is this a redox reaction? Maybe, you know, this was a redox decomposition. Maybe this is a redox combination. And so we look at the oxidation states. Do the oxidation states change in going from one side to the other? And what do you think? Does this look like a redox reaction? Does this look like the oxidation states did change? Well, let's take a look. What is chlorine here? <coughs> not, not the two, but plus seven is correct. You see, this is minus fourteen, and so this has got to be plus fourteen. So each is plus seven. What happened to chlorine here? What's the oxidation state of chlorine over here? Plus seven, and so the oxidation state of chlorine didn't change. What about oxygen? Minus two, minus two over here. It's Minus two. Minus two. Hydrogen, plus one, plus one. Oxidation states did not change. And so this is not a, a, a combination, a redox combination. You know what kind of combination we call this? This is called an acid-base combination reaction, or just an acid-base reaction. You know, the, the reason, um, you know, you guys learned about combination decomposition reactions, but there are different types of combination, different types of redox. For example, all the combination reactions I think you encountered in Chem 4 were redox combination reactions, but here's an example of an acid-base combination reaction. And so since combination reactions are not a unique category, you know, because they're subcategories of combination reactions, we just want to classify things into unique categories. You know, so for example, if somebody said combination reaction, you don't know what type of combination reaction they're talking about. Are they talking about an acid-base combination, a redox, or metathesis combination? Metathesis is a different type of uh, reaction. And so, uh, you know, that's ambiguous. So I'm going to get away from those classifications. We're going to classify things as the first reaction here is redox. This is, what's, how do you name this? Yields and oxygen. Good. How would you name this? Dichlorine heptaoxide. Is dichlorine heptaoxide one word or two words? Dichlorine heptaoxide. Two words. Two words, yeah. Dichlorine one and heptaoxide the other. <coughs> Hep Sometimes you get rid of the A, you know, the double vowel, heptaoxide, and just call it heptoxide. You know, that's often done. Uh, an example would be monoxide rather than monooxide, you know, carbon monoxide versus carbon monooxide. Um, Anyway, uh, obviously you know this. What is this? 
perchloric acid. Good. You were right on it. Perchloric acid. Um, what is this? You recognize this? No, no. Tell me the type of reaction from Chem 4. Can you tell me the type of reaction? In, in Chem 4, you learn different types of reactions, correct? And so tell me in your Chem 4 categories where reaction C falls. Is that a double replacement reaction? Uh huh. Is that a redox reaction? This is not a double replacement because double replacement we have um, compounds, you know, ionic compounds, right? This is not a. Uh, is this a is this a redox reaction? Yeah. We can tell if it's a redox reaction if the oxidation states do change. And so, what's this called? Nitrogen dioxide. What's the oxidation state of nitrogen? Plus four. Plus four. Over here, what's this called? Nitric acid. Nitric acid. What's the oxidation state of, in nitric acid? Plus five is correct. And so we're going from plus four to plus five, right? This is a redox reaction. In fact, nitric acid, nitric acid is... Um, a special acid that we call nitric acid and perchloric acid oxidizing acids. We call them oxidizing acids because perchlorate is a powerful, powerful, perchlorate is a powerful, no, perchloric acid is, is it, is perchloric acid a much more powerful acid than hydrochloric acid? Is perchloric acid, actually, let, let me um, take a survey. In water, is perchloric acid in water a much more powerful acid than hydrochloric acid in water? How many say yes? How many say no? How many don't know? Don't know. Um, actually, you know, what is acid? Acid strength is based on H+. Plus. So does perchloric acid have a lot more H+, plus in water than hydrochloric acid? No, they're, in fact, perchloric acid and hydrochloric acid are the same strength in water. But perchloric acid turns out to be much more reactive, not because of its acid properties, but because of its... Redox properties. You know perchlorate. I hope you know perchlorate by now. You know, I hope you, you memorized a little bit of factual knowledge. Do you memorize a little bit of factual knowledge about perchlorates? Actually, I stopped that video too soon. The, the, the main explosion came after. I, uh, I, I, I paused it. So you can take a look at the video. Hmm? You guys remember it, Stanley? You remember it? Yeah, yeah. But what kind of unstable is it? What kind of reactivity is it? You know, um, unstable is always relative. It's always relative to something else. You know. Hydrogen, you think, is very unstable, really explosive gas, but it could be quite stable. It depends on what you mix it with. If you mix hydrogen with nitrogen, no problem. That's going to be a very stable mixture. If you mix hydrogen with helium or neon or argon, no problem. And so st stability, we always rate. There are things called compatible chemicals. You know, compatible chemicals... Even though they could be highly reactive, they're stable. They form stable mixtures. And so perchloric acid is no problem as long as you don't mix it with what? And so you have to be more specific. You can't just say unstable in this class. You have to be much more specific in saying unstable because it's a what?
Yeah, I know like uh, a lot of videos and stuff like that. People just tune out because they don't necessarily think any of it is that important. But um, but does anybody remember anything about perchlorate? We're doing the two-pronged approach, you know. You can't do everything with theory. You have to memorize some stuff. Hopefully you memorize this. You know, it was just yesterday. The, you know, like they say, uh, memory fades quickly. So by the next day, it's, maybe it's all gone. Maybe you can recover it before the exam. Maybe not, you know. But somebody's got to know something about perchlorate. <clears throat> Uh, don't be shy. I'll try not to. Okay, Stanley. Yeah. It's an oxidizer. It's, it not only is it an oxidizer, it's a, in fact, not just a strong, it's a, you saw that explosion. You, it's a, <clears throat> Give me, a, give me something, a better adjective than just strong. Hmm? Reactive. It's reactive, for sure it's reactive. You know, I, I just want something to emphasize because we have different scales of reactivity, right? Sure, it's strong. HCl is a strong acid. No big deal. I spilled, I've spilled HCl all over my hands. Never worried about it. Yeah even though it's a strong acid, right? Strong electrolytes, I've, I've drank, you know, I've drank in strong electrolytes. Salt, Gatorade, that kind of stuff, right? On the range of scales, what would you put perchloric, you know? Would you just group it with all the other strong oxidizers? Or would you say it's... All strong oxidizers explode like that? It's explosive. In other words, um, we're trying to come up with a range. The range is, you know, chlorine, number one, chlorine, plus seven, chlorine. Chlorine is usually minus one. In fact, chloride with a minus one charge is extremely stable. Salts, like sodium chloride. Chloride fills up the ocean water, right? What do you think about chlorine in the plus seven? That's bad news. This is, this is extreme. I, I said this is extremely dangerous stuff, right? It's not just strong, it's very... reactive. And so it's a powerful oxidizer. And so um, you have to, you know, when you're trying to come up, because you can't just say, okay, I'm just going to consult the book. You know, you have to come up with some memorization so you know some relative... Strengths, uh, that type of stuff. And that, that type of stuff just comes, you know, um, plus seven, that should automatically throw some alarm bells up because plus seven, how many cations do you know that are plus seven? Name one cation that you know that's plus seven. What's the highest charge cation that you're, you're aware of? 
plus three. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think that's happy? A happy situation? No. And so anyway, I, uh, to make a long story short, we call HClO4 an oxidizing acid because you've got to watch out for other properties, not just its acid properties, but its oxidizing properties as well. Uh, the same thing with nitric acid. Nitric acid, what do you know about this? Is this just sin, sin, plain old strong acid, or is this a special acid? It's a special acid because of its redox properties. It's redox properties. We call nitric acid a, a, a powerful oxidizer and a strong acid. You know, when I was a, uh, uh, when I was on um, a student. Uh, graduate student at UCSB, uh, the, they shut down the freeway because there was an acid spill. And some truck, there was a collision, dumped a whole bunch of acid on the freeway. And the news person there was saying, oh, it's a hydrochloric acid spill. But, you know, I was looking at it, and it's just fumes, you know, these uh, orange plumes of smoke coming off the, off the freeway. Orange plumes of smoke, are you going to think that's hydrochloric acid? No. What, what acid is that, most likely? It's going to be nitric acid. It's likely a nitric acid spill. So they, they had it wrong. And you treat the two acids totally different. You know, you, you treat them totally different because, you know, HCl, rea the reactivity of HCl versus the reactivity of, um, of, um, <clears throat> Eight, uh, nitric acid is totally different. Nitric acid, uh, the brown smoke is NO2, nitrogen dioxide. And he, the guy in the video is saying, you know, he smelt sulfur type fumes. Well, NOx smells like sulfur type fumes. NOx. NO, NO is colorless. NO is easily oxidized to NO2, which is brown. Both of these are toxic gases. You gotta watch out. How about this acid? What is this acid called here? So this is a redox reaction here. The redox uh, oxidation states can change. How about this reaction here? Is this a redox reaction? Phosphoric acid. Yeah, this is phosphoric acid. Now, um, is phosphoric acid an oxidizing acid? <clears throat> what would your first inclination be? Uh huh. Oh, this is not phosphoric. This is phosphorous acid because phosphoric acid would be H3PO4. And since we have one less oxygen, we use the, rather than the ick, we use the aus ending. Right? Because this would be called phosphite rather than phosphate. Anyway, it, how about phosphorus acid? Is that an oxidizing acid? What would you think? Potentially yes or no? Potentially yes because tell me why or potentially no, tell me why. So what's the first thing you do? You know, I, you know, I, sometimes I ask this question and I get a blank page because nobody knows how to start. But you should know how to start. What's the first thing you do? Right. You look at the oxidation states. So you look at the oxidation states. Now, an oxidizer, is it electron poor or electron rich? Poor. Electron poor. And so you look, is that going to be an oxidizing acid or not? It has a lot of electrons. It has a lot of electrons? Yeah. Phosphate, phos, phosphate's minus three, phosphite is a minus three. That's a lot of electrons, you're right. 
But do we look at the net charge or, or do we look at the individual charges on the atoms? Individual charges. Have you guys been reviewing this stuff or not yet? You're going to wait until the exam comes up to start reviewing. Exam's coming when? Somebody, uh, Cecilia, you're asking about the practice. When, when's the exam coming? Two weeks from today? Hmm? Oh, from two weeks from last Tuesday. So, you know, you can wait and the weekend, maybe the weekend before the test, start reviewing. But, you know, it's very simple. You look at the oxidation states and you look. You know, that's what we've been doing. You look at the oxidation states and you look. You tell me, is that going to be an oxidizer or reducer? And so what are the oxidation states here? Minus 2 plus 1. So minus 6 plus 3 gives us minus 3, which means phosphorus is plus 3. Phosphorus plus three, hmm, would you say that's electron rich or electron poor? Maybe electron poor. Maybe it's an oxidizer. But when you look at phosphorus, how many valence electrons does it have? Five. And so, you know, I don't expect phosphite to be strong either way because it's kind of in the middle. You see, it's not at one of the extremes. Anyway, this is phosphorus plus 3. What is this phosphorus? Plus 3. Do you think this is a redox reaction? No. Compared to the reaction above, we compare it to the reaction above, and ah, it looks kind of the same. But in this case, you know, the chlorines minus 1, the hydrogen plus 1, the oxygen minus 2, nothing changed. And so this is not a redox reaction. If this is not a redox reaction, then what kind of reaction is this? Is this a double replacement reaction? No, because a double replacement would have had phosphite over here and just changed the cations. Right? This is not a double replacement. And so think back in Chem 4. How would you have categorized reaction D? This is an acid-base reaction, um, although you might have difficulty recognizing it. And so this is acid-base. So, so far we had redox, acid-base, redox, acid-base. Let's continue. Yeah. Not diphosphate. Diphosphorus. Diphosphorus tetrahydride goes to phosphorus trihydride. This is also known as phosphine. It smells awful and it's quite dangerous. And then what's this called? Is this called tetraphosphorus? Hmm? This is just called phosphorus. This is called white phosphorus. Phosphorus has different allotropes. White phosphorus occurs as these four atom cage molecules, which are kind of unstable. Interestingly, to keep white phosphorus stabilized, you, you hold it under water. Otherwise, when you expose white phosphorus to air, it starts to glow, luminesce. What kind of reaction? Well, this is a decomposition reaction. Well, as far as decomposition, what type of decomposition is this? This is a redox reaction. Do you see the phosphorus is going to change oxidation states here? The redox reaction. In fact, you know, I'm going to drop this decomposition combination. We're just going to classify things as redox reactions, acid-base reactions, and 
essentially double replacement, but double replacement can be tricky to, to identify. So rather than calling them double replacement, I'm going to start calling them metathesis because some double replacement reactions don't follow the same pattern. So for example, when you make, make a mixed cation salt, you know, is an A, B plus C, D? No, it's a little bit more complicated because you got mixed cations in there, potassium, sodium, whatever, right? And so um, uh, we aren't going to call it uh, double replacement. We're going to call them metathesis. And so uh, this, this next reaction is what? This is white phosphorus plus chlorine. chlorine. So the two elements, you combine them, you form what's this? Is this a redox, acid base, or metathesis? This is a redox. You see the oxidation states would change. Over here, let's look at this. Um, what's this called? Iron trichloride. No. Or, uh, iron three chloride. Yeah, iron three chloride. We're going to use uh, the rules for ionic compounds, metal plus non-metal. So iron three chloride plus. This would be called uh, dihydrogen sulfide, according to our. Uh, normal rules. But dihydrogen, nobody calls it dihydrogen sulfide. You know what everybody calls this? Everybody calls this hydrogen sulfide gas. Hydrogen sulfide gas. This is also an acid, too. What is the name of the acid? This is a hydrogen sulfide gas. The acid name would be Hydrosulfuric acid is correct. Yeah. When did you have Chem 4? Did you take Chem 4 here, Stanley? Or you didn't? No, I didn't. You did it? How long ago was it? In the summer? Okay. That's why it's so fresh then. Maybe. Or you just learned. That's good. Nomenclature pretty well. What's this? Iron 3 sulfide, and in gas form, this is called hydrogen chloride gas. In aqueous form, this is called hydrochloric acid. And so both of these occur as gases. Hydrogen sulfide is an exceptionally toxic gas. A lethal dose is in the part per billion range, but you can smell it at the part per billion range. The problem with hydrogen sulfide is it's easy to detect because it smells like rotten eggs. In fact, um, rotten eggs do produce some hydrogen sulfide. But the problem is it desensitizes your, uh, your nose. And so pretty soon you lose the ability to smell hydrogen sulfide. And so some people actually end up, end up um, dying because they think the hydrogen sulfide's dispersed, but it's still there. They just can't smell it anymore. So, so somebody died in Ventura not so long ago from hydrogen sulfide poisoning. Well, anyway, what kind of reaction is this? Is this a redox reaction? No, it's not a redox. In fact, this looks like a double replacement reaction. Double replacement reactions, we're going to give the name a metathesis. This is a metathesis reaction or double replacement. And so C, double replacement. Let's go down here to the next one. Here. Um, is this a double replacement reaction here? In a way, yes. You know, you could consider this one as a double replacement if you um, think of uh, water as being the hydrogen ion with the hydroxide anion. If water is a hydrogen ion with a hydroxide anion, then the hydroxides just went to magnesium to form magnesium hydroxide. And the hydrogens went to, what's this anion called? What is this compound called? D. Magnesium. Magnesium. Speak up because I can't can't hear you. Yes, it is magnesium nitride. Nitride has what charge? Is 
Do the read off up here on the table. Nitride is what charge? Ne negative three. And the magnesium plus two. Ammonia can be thought of as being the nitride anion with hydrogen cations. And so in a way, this can be thought of as a double replacement type reaction. But um, technically, we're going to classify this as a redox or acid base instead. This is acid base reaction here. And so, so far, we've gone through eight reactions, and we've classified those eight reactions into three categories. Right? The, what are the three categories that we classified those in? Well, acid base, redox, and metathesis. All right, let's continue. All right, name this PBO. PBO. Lead 2 oxide. Does somebody know the old fashioned name for lead 2 oxide? Plumbic is wrong. Plumbus. Plumbus oxide. Plumbic is lead 4. This is only lead 2. This is, uh, what's this called again? NH3? Ammonia. Ammonia. Forms lead. lead, nitrogen, and water. And so what kind of reaction is this? Automatically, you should be able to tell what kind of reaction it is because we've got the element there, no element here. This has got to be a redox reaction. So when you're looking at this, is this a combination reaction? Is this a decomposition reaction? Did you have this category of reaction in your Chem 4? No, right? I think you didn't. And so that Chem 4 categorization scheme, you know, how many different types of reactions did you learn in Chem 4? You had precipitation, you had um, acid-base neutralization, you had uh, gas formation. What else? Combination, decomposition. You know, that wasn't en enough categories. You need way more categories, right? Or we try to um, condense things into fewer categories. And so what we're going to do is we're going to forget all those Chem 4 categories, and we're just going to condense things into fewer categories and see. You know, does this work out or not? And so what kind of reaction is this? Is a, is a redox reaction. Which one do you think is electron poor? Which one do you think is electron rich in this particular redox? Well, um, looking at this, minus 2, plus 2, plus 1, minus 3, 0. So we went from plus 2 to 0. What happened? To go from plus 2 to 0, we must have gained electrons. And so this must have been the electron-poor species because it took electrons. But who did it take electrons from? Nitrogen in ammonia. You know, because plain old nitrogen, plain old nitrogen fills this room, but plain old nitrogen is extremely unreactive. You know, this room consists of about 80% nitrogen. That 80% nitrogen is almost thought of as inert. Why is nitrogen considered almost a, an inert gas? And in fact, it's called a pseudo-inert gas. Um, well, chlorine is diatomic, and that's not really inert, you know that's actually quite reactive. It's not because it's diatomic. It's because it's quite stable. It's quite stable, well, why? It's quite stable because of the triple bond. Triple bonds are hard to break. Um, so the triple bond is exceptionally stable and unreactive. And so uh, this is why. And so this is a redox reaction. See, ammonia must be a, you know, look at, if you think about lead 2 oxide, I don't think of lead 2 oxide as being an especially powerful oxidizer. Do you? You know, because there's something called lead 4 oxide. Lead 4 oxide would be a much more powerful oxidizer than lead 2 oxide because lead 4 oxide is plus 4 versus lead 2 oxide, which is plus 2. And so this tells me the relative stability of ammonia or the reactivity of ammonia. That means ammonia must be a pretty decent 
what? Pretty decent reducer. So ammonia is quite reactive, right? Will ammonia burn? Sure, it will burn. It will form nasty gases like NO and NO2, which are quite toxic. All right, let's go on here. What do we have in this next reaction? What's this? Iron 2 sulfate forms iron 3 oxide. And so we went from iron 2 to iron 3. That means um, it lost, right? To go from plus 2 to plus 3, it lost an electron. Well, who did, who, who did it lose an electron to? Because there's nothing else here. Who did iron 2 lose the electron to? Sulfate. Now, is sulfate an oxidizer? Think about that. Sulfate. Is sulfate an oxidizer? And, and if so, why? Why would you think sulfate might be an oxidizer? Might take electrons. Well, what, what's the oxidation state? Well, oxygen is, yeah, minus 2. That means sulfur must be plus. Look at the periodic table and tell me, do you think sulfate's going to be an oxidizer? Sulfur is plus 6. How many valence electrons does sulfur have? Six. So apparently it's lost all its valence electrons, which means, what do you think? Oxidizer? Yeah. And so sulfuric acid, you have to watch out for because sulfuric acid is considered a, well, obviously it's a strong acid, but it's also a, Um, yeah, uh, well, actually, sulfuric acid is not nearly as strong of an oxidizer as perchloric or nitric. Perchloric and nitric are way stronger oxidizers than sulfuric. Even though you'd expect sulfuric to be a powerful oxidizer because it is sulfur in the plus six, it's just not nearly as reactive. And that has to do, you know, uh, later on when we talk about the size of atoms and that kind of stuff, maybe it'll make more sense, you know, as far as this go. Other factors go. But anyway, sulfate is the oxidizer, iron 2 is the reducer, and you, do you think iron 2 sulfate is explosive? Because here we have the fuel and the oxidizer in the same compound. Do you think it's explosive? <laughs> like... Uh, Ammonium perchlorate? Um, potentially, I mean, this, potentially this could detonate because it's forming gases. When something forms gases, it generates shock wave, especially if a lot of energy and a lot of gas is produced in a short amount of time. But, you know, no, it's, I wouldn't expect it because it's not, a, not an exceptionally powerful oxidizer. No, and iron 2, well, iron 2 is a decent reducer. But, you know, it, it all depends on the conditions because, you know, under certain conditions, some things might be mild. Under other conditions, they could be quite uh, violent. And um, let's take a look at, you know, rust. Epi 203. <coughs> Name this, Fe203 is called iron three oxide. You know, do you think iron of iron three oxide is being a powerful oxidizer? Yes? No? Not really. You know, it's just rust, right? And then aluminum. Solid. What do you think about aluminum solid? Tell me about aluminum. Electron poor, electron rich? Mm 
In the middle? Yeah. Well, this, um, this reaction is a very interesting reaction. You know what rust plus aluminum, this reaction has a name? Well, that, it, it's been given to it. A lot of reactions have names associated, but this, this is just a redox reaction. You know, the electron poor species would be what in this combination? The electron poor species would be? The iron, the rust, or the aluminum? Electron poor. Oh, how about the electron rich? The electron rich species would be what? Oh boy, you know, I can guarantee you guys better grades if you uh, if you just change it the way you study. For sure, you can guarantee yourself better grade um, by reviewing sooner before the memory fades. You know, uh, capture a little bit more of that memory and be able to recall a little more, and then you'll do good. But if you continue, you know, then the memory is going to fade more and more, and by the time the exam comes in a week and a half. It's like starving all over. You know, you got to expose yourself to hours and hours of just to get it back of study. Well, which one is the electron rich species? I mean, this is just recall. I guess I already told you the electron rich uh, it should be aluminum, right? Metals are electron rich. And so this is electron rich species. So this should be the electron poor species because of the iron three. This reaction. This reaction is called the thermite reaction. And um, under certain conditions, the thermite reaction has many uses. But one of the uses of the thermite reaction is they use it to weld ship hulls, like big ships, like tanker ships. Why? Because it um, turns out quite a bit of energy is released from this. And so let's take a look. If you haven't seen the thermite reaction, then it's worth a look. Work goggles. Just like the touch paper, you stand well back. The fuse triggers the irreversible thermite reaction. A scorching hot meets freezing cold, a fierce battle rages. The smoke clears, and incredibly, nothing remains. The thermite burns at two and a half thousand degrees. It releases a raging torrent of molten iron, which rains down on the liquid nitrogen, boiling the glacial mixture away in the form of vapor and melting the cylinder, leaving just a puddle of white hot iron. A clear victory for thermite. So there you go, that adding something cold to thermite doesn't cancel it out. It just makes it angry. Thermite. It's been specially chosen to be destroyed because it's old, it's white, but more importantly, because it's French. The engine block is the densest part of the car. It's basically a huge lump of metal, and, well, it's very hard to melt. Lucky then, the Brainiacs have plenty of thermite, specially packed into the slow-release mechanism of a garden flower pot. A big 
pile on the bonnets directly over the engine block should do the trick. Time to light the fuse and give this homage to French engineering the send-off it so richly deserves. The irreversible thermite reaction begins. Eats through the bonnet, spraying molten thermite into the engine beneath. The devastation continues inside until finally a torrent of white hot liquid metal pours out of the bottom, signaling the inevitable victory for thermite. A quick check confirms a clear path of destruction through the engine. Now that the engine is perfectly through, it seems only fitting to have a go at the petrol tank. Packed into the slow release mechanism of a garden fire pot, the thermite is ready for action. Popped under the roof, directly above the fuel tank, on the topper, and just four feet of family car stands between the thermite and eight gallons of petrol. Bite the touch paper and stand well back. The irreversible thermite reaction begins. melts through the car in seconds. It's two and a half thousand degree heat igniting the expanding petrol in a devastating fire. Leaving behind a car that won't be going very far anytime soon. So, uh, redox reactions, we, we're always very careful. This is why, you know, when you designate an acid, an oxidizing acid, we're always very careful because redox reactions can be potentially quite violent in comparison to double replacement. When we're thinking about doing a precipitation reaction or something like that, you know, I, I don't really worry too much about explosions. You might have a lot of gas being generated. You might have some heat. But you don't really worry too much about explosions. Or even acid base. When you do an acid base neutralization, you know, do you have an explosion shield protecting you from your burette in the titration? You ever think about even even if you take a strong acid like HCl and a strong base like sodium hydroxide and you titrate those, shouldn't you be shouldn't you have an explosion shield? Why or why not? Shouldn't you have an explosion shield? Strong acid, HCl, strong base, sodium hydroxide, explosion shield required. Right? And so when you say, say strong, you got to put it into some kind of perspective because we deal with strong. Like I said, I spill strong acid on my hands all the time. Strong base, sodium hydroxide. You know, it's, yeah, it gets hot, certain things, burns, you know, but I'm not too worried. But you got a strong oxidizer, it's the same thing. No, you treat it totally different. And so this is why we have this, you know, category of uh, oxidizing acids, because those are powerful oxidizers, and those you got to be careful with. And so why, uh, I think based on experience, you know, acid-base reactions aren't that big of a deal. Precipitation reactions aren't that big of a deal. I'm not going to put an explosion shield if I'm precipitating out barium sulfate. You know, I told you to add the barium chloride slowly, right? I didn't tell you there's going to be a potential explosion, you know, as barium ions and sulfate ions come together and precipitate out, right? You do have to be careful, you know, with um, some reactions generating too much heat. For example, when you add acids to water, like if you were to add sulfuric acid to water, a lot of heat's generated. And so that, that's why you always do double A. Have you heard of double A? Always add acids to water because the water will act as a heat sink. Never the other way around. Never add water to acid. If you add water to acid, then 
the water that, that you add can superheat and cause splattering until you get a steam explosion. And so it, it's not that acid-base reactions aren't potentially dangerous. They can be very dangerous because if that steam explosion happens, when you add water to concentrated sulfuric acid, what happens is it shoots up concentrated sulfuric acid and gets on everything. And if you've ever seen concentrate, concentrated sulfuric acid will cause third-degree burns on your skin, basically. And one person did get a small third-degree burn here in Chem 1B one time. And so, uh, yeah, you don't, uh, you, it's not to say that they aren't potentially dangerous, but are you going to worry about a thermite size reaction when you, when you do that, you know? If so, you got to hold, hold it with some kind of robotic arms, right? Do it with an explosion shield. And so the question is, is, you know, do you, do you have a, a, an idea of why redox reactions can be potentially so much more energetic and so much more violent than acid base or double replacement, i.e. metathesis reactions? And so think about that, and we're going to um, take a break and start up.